Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today it's going to be a little bit of a history lesson in gaming. You see, with all the Black Friday sales and Autumn sales, it is cool to see that X-Wing Simulator and TIE Fighter Simulator are both top sellers on goodoldgames.com. They just got added recently, and I've been meaning to play them for old time's sake. They, are re you know, they really have stood the test of time from what I understand. But one thing that did catch me was when all the news coverage was coming out, a lot of lazy journalists went so far as to say that X-Wing was the first game to have polygon graphics. Now, I think this was a fact that journalists copied from other articles, and it's become something of a myth that I've seen repeated by people that should know better. Now, it's kind of understandable, because if you had a PC, the previous biggest space fighting simulator was Wing Commander, which used bitmap graphics. And also, Lawrence Holland, the developer of X-Wing, had previously worked on three uh, World War II games, uh, Battle Hawks 1942, Their Finest Hour, and of course, Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe. And those had used sprite graphics for all the aircraft. So it's understandable why some people might have been under the impression that the state of the art was all scaled sprite technology, but the truth was, 3D shaded polygon graphics had a long history for almost a decade prior to the release of X-Wing Simulator. And let me be clear, I'm not talking about vector-based graphics such as those found in Battlezone, uh, the Star Wars coin-op, or uh, Elite, for example. Now, everything I'm going to talk about here actually filled in the gaps between the lines to uh, represent the world. So let's move back to 1984 to a little-known coin-op, which I think is the earliest example of 3D polygon graphics. This is iRobot, developed by Atari Corporation. It was a pretty obscure title. It uh, was actually more expensive than many of the games of the era. It used a very abstract style. The idea was you had to kind of run around all these red areas, and when you run over them, it would attack the shield, and by running to the end, you could then attack the eye and destroy the eye. Now, this was obviously all implemented on custom hardware. I don't think there was anything else that used the same platform as this. The copyright date says 1983, but I believe that it wasn't actually released until uh, 1984. It's actually surprisingly uh, smooth for how old the game is. Obviously, that comes from custom hardware. Uh, I believe it was a 6809 CPU with some extra hardware for, uh, for accelerating vertex calculations. The resolution was 256 by 232. So yeah, the idea is you had to jump across these gaps to solve the maze. And if you jumped when the eye was open, you would be zapped. Also really interesting was the included Doodle City, the Ungame. Yes, the Ungame dates back to the early 80s. For every credit, you got three minutes of playtime to paint a picture using the, uh, well, to using the various parts that uh, come in the game, various models. This was apparently an accident that happened, or is, it was inspired by an accident, where the, you know, a bug caused the object erase to not actually happen. And the developers kind of liked what it came up with. I'm not sure if anybody actually played it. Maybe people, people did. I don't know. But this was a summer of 1984. In the summer of 1984, something else was released. The Last Starfighter has the distinction of being one of those movies that uh, was a huge pioneer of computer graphics, with most of its space scenes being rendered on Cray supercomputers. However, to tie in with the movie, Atari planned to develop a version of the game which was featured in the movie. Again, it was going to be based on custom hardware using a pair of uh, 6 to 8,000 CPUs. It was supposedly prototyped, uh, but no hardware was actually built. But when the time came to actually figure out what it would take to build this, the executives at Atari decided that it was going to cost too much per machine. It was going to cost about $10,000 per machine, and that was believed to be too expensive. If the movie had been a bigger hit, then you can believe that they would have done it. 
So anyway, where does this come from? Well, this is a fan remake made by Rogue Synapse. They Somebody wanted to actually build their own Starfighter machine. So, of course, you needed a game to run on it. So somebody went and made a version which runs on Windows, and they've tried to copy as much from the game as possible. It's really hard to play because you have independent controls to move the site within that, uh, within that area and you have multiple weapon systems, it uses two joysticks and multiple fire buttons and I don't have those mapped correctly so I was just trying to play this with on keyboard. It has many of the scenes from the movie, you've obviously got waves and waves of scout ships, waves of fighter ships and of course ultimately a take on the command ship, destroy it, get your name in the high score charts, get abducted by aliens and of course join the Star League to fight against Zur and the Kodan Armada. Anyway, that was all in custom hardware. The first game that I can find that does solid filled polygons on a home system is Star Strike 2, and this is on the 8-bit Sinclair Spectrum. And you see that the Spectrum doesn't really have a huge color palette. In fact, what it's really doing is stippling. There's different patterns for different colors here. The Sinclair Spectrum was a horrifically basic piece of hardware, and yet people made it do amazing things. I don't know if any of you follow Ben Heck's channel, but uh, he actually has a three-parter where he tries to take an old Sinclair Spectrum and rebuild it into a handheld, and I found out all sorts of stuff about that hardware that I never knew. Anyway, yeah, look, we have a station here, and I'm trying to shoot off the keys on the outside so I can open the door for some reason. It seems very strange to have your keys on the outside there. Once I've got lined up, I can enable docking mode, which requires me to match rotation with it so I can fly in. And once I'm in here, I can continue my invasion against the outsiders. The frame rate is, of course, terribly slow. So there we go, shoot the parked fighter. And I have to shoot these keys now to stop the door from opening or stop the door from closing. Now it's a case of flying through the force fields here to try and avoid, well I'm trying to avoid the the various panels and stuff flying around. Yes, um, as I said, this was an 8-bit computer with no dedicated graphics coprocessor or anything. Very low resolution and in fact screen addressing on a Sinclair Spectrum was actually way more complicated than uh, we have to deal with these days. But yet many of the coders that started on these 8-bit systems are still working in the industry today, although they tend to be producers and uh, game designers rather than actual hardware hackers. The game was also released on the Amstrad CPC 464, which was a... Um, it was always the, the third favourite computer between the Sinclair Spectrum and the Commodore 64. But you see that it did manage to have more colours, and it did seem to run at a little faster frame rate, surprisingly. Anyway, also in 1986, we have the Sentinel, which doesn't use traditional polygons, but it's worth looking at because it does do a lot of very cool things. It does fractal landscapes generated from a random seed. It does solid 3D graphics. Albeit, they, uh, they draw it in an interesting way. As you pan across the landscape, it's only drawing a small section every time it scrolls. So it's actually obviously saving itself a lot of CPU power. The object of the Sentinel was that you have to absorb energy from the landscape to build rocks so that you can get higher and higher. And once you get high enough, you can absorb the Sentinel, which is the highest point in the landscape. And obviously the Sentinel is trying to absorb you, but he can only turn very slowly. It's actually still uh, very much playable today, in part because it uses a lot of tricks to accelerate the graphics. So yeah, this is a BBC Model B here. Uh, the other one was a Sinclair Spectrum and an Amstrad. As great as a Commodore 64 was for sprites and audio, I can't think of a single you know 3D game that didn't use vectors. But I could be wrong on that one, so please correct me. Anyway, around 1986, we also have this advent of the 16-bit systems, the Amiga and the Atari ST. And actually, at that point, the floodgates opened. There are a lot of games that I can think of that were released on the Amiga and the Atari ST, which used 3D graphics such as this. 
This is one that I want to highlight because this is Starglider 2. Starglider 2 is made by Argonaut Software, that's Jez San. He's the guy that made the original Star Fox or Star Wing, depending upon if you're which country you're in. Now this wasn't the first uh, 3D filled polygon game on the Atari ST or the Amiga. I believe the Carrier Command came out before it, and there might be something else. But it ha does have spaceships, which uh, does mean that it is has a good claim to being the first and best 3D spaceship game because Star Strike 2 was, you know, dubious gameplay at best. Star Glider is actually still pretty playable. It has a grand a whole solar system to explore. You can leave each planet, fly up into space, and then once you're in space, you can have encounters in deep space. Uh, you can fly to a bunch of different planets, and the aim of the game is to collect the parts and assemble a mega weapon to defeat the enemy's mega weapon, which will fire at a certain amount, a certain point in time, and uh, obliterate your home world. And uh, each planet has different resources available. Some some of them will have silos with people in it who will trade for you. Some of the locations will just have stuff floating, uh, sorry, sitting on the surface. There are a whole bunch of vehicle designs. There are space whales. There are sun, your know, manta rays that sun them, that fly in the sun's upper atmosphere. There are walking enemies. There are flying enemies, like as in flapping wings enemies. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to see and of course you get multiple weapon systems and yeah you can fly underground although it's not exactly Return of the Jedi level speed. It's very very sedate. You can kind of stop yourself at any point. Uh, the frame rate is really quite quite terribly low underground which is why it's a good thing you're not really fighting. You have a little tractor beam that you can use to pluck things from the ground, pick them up and put them in your hold. These are a bunch of bouncing bombs which you can use against targets. So yeah, that is Starglider 2, which uh, is by Argonaut Software. One interesting thing is that the developer is clearly a fan of iRobot because they included a painting mini mode. This is painting with Rolf, which is a reference to Rolf Harris back in the days when he was you know, loved by the nation. Well, uh, that's all changed now, I guess. Okay, moving swiftly on, we have another game which I think is worth looking at these days. This is actually just a demo of Damocles. Now, Damocles is the sequel to Mercenary. Mercenary is another uh, kind of vector graphics-based exploration games. But Damocles added an entire solar system. It also improved a little over Starglider by having the planets have phases, so they have a day side and a night side as you're flying through space. But you'll see the computer is just uh, filling out all these details, trying to sell us on the game. Also interesting with this one is you can see my speed is very close to light speed and I have to deal with time dilation. Which is important because the whole goal of Damocles is you have to fly around the solar system, explore it, and figure out how to stop a giant comet from hitting one of the planets and destroying it. It's interesting because there's actually a bunch of different ways to defeat it. Uh, you know, you can get uh, all the explosives that you can find in the solar system. I think you have to get nine of them, put them in a big pile and blow them up. Or there's another way where you manufacture a special super bomb that will blow it up. And apparently, if you can find the developer's chair, the developer's computer in the developer's chair, then you can sit in it, hack into the game, and randomly destroy items if you want, including the comet. Incidentally, if you are one of these people that have remarked that the spaceship designs in Elite look like cheese wedges, well, the developer of this, in the original Mercenary, there was actually a giant piece of cheese, which if you got inside it like a vehicle would fly around like a spaceship. So this cheese wedge analogy was clearly on the minds of the developers even back in the 1980s. This was released in 1990 incidentally. And yeah, it also features some other interesting tricks. It was one of the first games I've seen that had detail levels. It would replace the roads with simple straight lines when you got a long way away so that it would still render faster. Of course, yes, uh, you can get out of your spaceship, as I pointed out. You can land your spaceship, get out of it, and walk around. There's not really much in the way of space combat. It's more about exploration and sort of like role-playing. So yeah, the one 
pure combat game from the era. It was actually released in 1989. It is Warhead by Glyn Williams. Glyn Williams also made the I War or Independence War games. And Warhead has the distinction of being the only game I think that I've played on the 16-bit systems which had, you know, full 3D graphics, full first-person graphics and it has full Newtonian motion. It also has really good presentation all the way through. It opens up with this opening crawl with a document explaining the history of the conflict, explaining about the aliens. You see that they're insectoids, they get laid as an egg, they come to a larva, then you get a kind of child and eventually they grow to an adult. It explains that they have a group consciousness because they can communicate via radio. Obviously, this is borrowing heavily from uh, the likes of Ender's Game. There are a lot of references to science fiction in the game. It's also one of the first games that has its soundtrack made up of uh, samples that are, you know, sequenced rather than a simple, uh, in, you know, sequence of music. And there we see a reference to this space fortress with a, a, an astronaut out there working on EVA. The Fist of Earth spacecraft. Uh, one of the ugliest spacecraft, I think, in video game history. But you know, it's designed to be—it's designed to be tough. It doesn't have shields. It has weapons, and it has a lot of engine power. So yeah, Warhead. Let's give it a quick look to show you how it works. So here I am in Sol Base. It's rotating and bringing up the message. It says, "Have fun out there. You must familiarize yourself, and you must take off, and you must fly." So. Like Babylon 5, uh, but which uh, this predates, you launch by dropping out the bottom of a rotating station. So I've pressed eight, pressed the buttons to bring up my heads up display, and I drop out the bottom. You see somebody has scrawled hell this way, so we fall out, and we're we're flying away from the station. Now notice the green dots floating through space. Those are on my heads up display to give me a clue as to what way I'm moving. The stars are very big and bright, you'll notice. <laughs> Clearly I have some sort of enhanced vision thing going on. And I'm getting told I have a message. Take the ship away from the Sol base. Well, that's really easy. I would just keep going. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Yes, I will keep going in this direction. Now, I have I have only two thrust directions. I can thrust forwards or backwards, and those are both bound to the left button and the right button. So there's me thrusting backwards a little. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that I have this horrific fisheye effect as I turn. That is intentional. Apparently the developers wanted to have this really wide fisheye look, uh, suggesting that the pilot would have their senses augmented. Okay, so this is telling me to dock back at the Sol base. Now, uh, notice that the heads-up display, the grid, turned, to gre turned from green to blue as I picked up speed. As you get really fast, it actually goes red. This is a great idea. I wish it was done in more games. It would stop people complaining about space dust being, you know, completely wrong. Anyway, talking about the presentation, we have a little database of known ships. So this is the Fist of Earth. Uh, you can see that this one, unlike the other games, is actually trying to shade the polygons, although it only has like three levels. It has light, dark, and white. This is an asteroid. So yeah, you have pink, red, and, and white. Sol base. Actually, yeah, I guess there's more than three shades. There might be four levels of shading. The Corsair. Note the little uh, flashy lights that are used to signify engines. Those work really, really well, actually, in the game. Tech ship totally doesn't look like an Imperial shuttle. Super freighter, um, yes, well, easy meet if you see them. And the pilot recovery module, which is essentially an escape capsule, which you can use in some missions to uh, avoid getting destroyed. Anyway, let's head back. What I can do is I can select the target and actually use autopilot. This will help me. There's a lot of autopilot modes which help cancel out velocity or approach a target, tail a target, move within range. Or there's actually an inertialess mode where if you select it, it will let you travel at low speeds and it will automatically null your velocity for you. 
The inertialist mode isn't really much good for combat, but it is kind of useful for uh, navigating. So yeah, it's telling me to now dock with the station, and I'll use inertialist mode to actually fly along these docking lights and get close to the axis. Actually, inertialist mode is too fast for docking, so you've got to get in close, and then once you're in close, you then have to switch to regular navigation mode and bring yourself in very, very slowly. Thankfully, there's no need to match rotations against this station, although that was a that's a thing that a lot of games seem to like to force you to do. So I'll just move in here very slowly. I'll just try and match rotations. Look, there we go. Through the middle. And yeah, again, presentation keeps up. We have these nice little cutscenes as we dock. There are actually a lot of uh, mini cutscenes, and this was a couple of years before Wing Commander really uh, made that a core part of the game. You know, what Chris Roberts brought with uh, Wing Commander was presentation. So yeah, we actually have a bunch of the local stars all modelled and in the correct location. Although the planets at this point were all totally made up. I like the fact that Tau Ceti has Niven, uh, what else? It has a whole bunch of planets related to Larry Niven. So we have Moat, um, Gift, Protector, and let's zoom out a little further. Ring, obviously a reference to Ring World. Uh, foot, which is Footfall, and Integral, the Integral Trees. Yes, uh, there's a lot of sci fi nerd spotting going on. E Epsilon, Eridani, Leuton. Uh, and you can just rotate this thing around, Ross 128. So uh, there's a few other that have planets named for fictional authors. We have PKD, Albemuth. Uh, right, wait, wait. PKD was not a fictional author. He was an author of science fiction. But some of the names are references to science fiction. Scanner, Goldenman, and uh, Castle. Yeah, all of those should be obvious to Philip K. Dick fans, right? Uh, Alpha Centauri, you can of course search for it. It has banks! Yes, we all know where that's coming from, going, or wherever. We have a reference to Ian M. Banks' first science fiction novel, Consider Flabus, which everybody should have read because it's great. And then we have some uh, reference to his regular contemporary fiction, Glass, Wasp, and The Bridge. Anyway, if you can put up with its very primitive graphics, there is actually a pretty solid uh, story and game here. It really deserves to be remade. This is one of the missions about 40 minutes into the game. You're getting told to jump to a star which is producing gravitational anomalies and they're saying, oh wait, it's a black hole. And you see, yeah, my, me falling backwards into this star as it's sucking me down. Oh. There it is behind me. I gotta figure out what way I go, and I'm confused, disoriented, and I fall into the black hole. So, yeah, that was a quick tour around old 3D games. At some future video, I hope to be playing X Wing Simulator, but until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.